approaches in terms of emission reduction, which one of them that is very critical is the aspect of transportation. And that is why we have chosen this topic, accelerating sustainable mobility, the future of two wheelers in West Africa. And we will to wonder why we didn't expand it further. Yeah, it could have covered everything concerning mobility. But we wanted to connect, or we want to connect with you. We know that two three wheelers um, resonates more, and uh, it's something that if we want to really drive the journey of emission reduction and energy transition, uh, where we feel that Africa or West Africa should start from. Once again, I will welcome you to this panel discussion. Um, sit back and listen to the conversation this afternoon. And also while the sessions are going on, if you have your questions and anything, please do well to put them together. Uh, the moderator would get everything back from you. At this point, I would like to invite the operations manager for the electricity hub to tell us briefly um, about the organization while also giving us the opening remarks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Omono Okonkwo, the head of operations at the Electricity Hub next year. Thank you so much for joining us for this side event on e-mobility with focus on two, three wheelers in West Africa. Thank you very much. We can't really show you how grateful we are to have you here, but we just say Thank you. And we encourage you to stay through to the end and understand what the Electricity Hub does and the message we're trying to pass to you today through our esteemed panelists. So without wasting time, I'll call on Dr. Kwanza, our moderator for the day, to get this started. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, it is my singular honor to moderate this uh, this session on e-mobility, focusing on the two three segment. In fact, I called uh, David to ask him um, the, the two three segments. Just that focusing on how we can expand, and he said no. We are focusing very sharply. On the two three segment. And I think there's a very good case uh, for, for this, this focus. But my name is, uh, is a moderator, so it means that I'm only going to facilitate the conversation. The real actors are the, um, the experts who will be sharing their, their deep knowledge with us. Um, for this session, we have Three panelists. From PMUST, we have Dr. Godwin. Kafu, I repeat. Please, uh, Godwin is here. Okay, he may have stepped out. From industry, from Wahoo e Mike. We have Casey in Japan, who is a product manager. Casey in Japan, yes. This is our table, right? Okay, please come this way. Please let, let's put our hands together for Casey. Yes, um, from the Energy Commission of Ghana, we have Doris Adohi. Doris, thank you for coming. Peace. And then um, Dr. Godwin Ayuta is here from KMUST. Godwin, please take your seat at the, at the table. Okay. So your organization, what do you Responsible for all two and three million production and uh, research and development. So happy to be here and uh, looking forward to the discussion. 
and the project coordinator for the Drive Electric Initiative, you know, the initiative that we started a couple of years ago that has been driving the ecosystem enabling for EV. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to work out with you. Thank you, guys. It's Gabriel, Kathy, and I'm the University of Science of Energy. I'm the chair of the new energy vehicles and sustainable transport. Also, the University of Science and Technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, please let's put our hands together for our distinguished panelists. So, I, I will balance from academia to industry to government sector. My very first question to all three panelists would be the transition to is important. And then, um, if you can, also add a little bit to why the that segment in particular uh, should be of interest to us in Ghana, in Nigeria, in West Africa. Let me start with Chrissy from, from industry. Yes, uh, so particularly the transition to uh, quite important for many of us. Also, is due to the environmental impact of um, the fossil fuels and the ice dangers. And the working back home on the working back home is more sustainable. And uh, then, over time, actually, and it's simple to implement than the ice bath room. So, from that perspective, it's much more attractive actually to move to the electric drive room. Um, environmentally, of course, it just means that we produce the environment less. Uh, in transportation, and um, yeah, this is a quite an advantage if you scroll through and then the cities. Ryan, if you scroll through any of the mega cities, uh, you realize that there's quite a lot of uh, fumes in the air, particularly in Russia, and uh, it's one of the things that's impacting the quality of life in these areas, and as well as the noise. So, when in terms of transport, uh, these two reasons are like a uh, good. Uh, you see, motivation to be more focused on continuing and the growth of sports. I mean, for the protection of our two employees, we can be able to ladder. Two employees are more accessible to the market than the four year old generally, uh, which is why we see so in most of the countries that uh, have embraced mobility and the last game. And that's clearly with EVs as I need uh, something which is now being introduced. And there's always that um, initial um, so accessibility challenge around like pricing because there's relatively not that many. The two emails I think allows us to mitigate this and um, introduce more people into the sector. So uh, that's it. Next question. So yeah. do I take this in question? Yeah, same Yeah, I, I would say, I mean. First, I would speak from the government perspective. I would speak from the perspective as well. Um, as, as a country, we all have our targets. We have our climate targets. We have our energy transition target. We have the targets in terms of where we want to live as a country. But where do we transition from energy into transport electrification, into all that conversation? It has to start from somewhere as a country where it will definitely feed into our climate targets. Today, if you put the NBCs for Ghana, we have various big, big targets. Our biggest emission components as a country is coming from two main places, energy and transport. So I think without saying transport electrification would actually help us to solve some of these issues. It may not be that we can solve the issues now, but it's a step towards that kind of conversation because it's very important for us to let us fight transport. If we take Ghana as a whole, let's zoom into Ghana into our energy transition conversations where right? we want to um the transition to clean energy production um to clean energy use. But also as a country we want to transition away from polluting and a bit of clean air when it comes to transport 
commission and the rates. So where do we have to do that? And that's where you see our energy transition plan clearly stating how we're going to move in terms of transport and how we're going to move in terms of energy. So transport electrification, of course, sits big on our agenda as energy transition and also clearly on our planet agenda. We took the whole context of the world and we both need to build the energy outlook as it comes in and we look at all around the world. We see what is going to happen in the next 10 years, 5 to 10 years. I mean, uh, five years ago, we started the initiative and this was going to take a path. Now it's become more drastic, even the others, right? We're seeing that clearly we're going to have a lot of um, EVs that are going to be produced out there. We're going to stop production of um, ICE vehicles. When I say ICE here, I mean internal combustion engine vehicles. The conversation now becomes where do the ICE vehicles go? Who will be taking them? So how does our market react to what is happening on the other side of the world, which, whether we like it or not, is going to influence us here? I mean, having the cars we have here, let me think of the numbers of EV drivers at the of the cars we have here, most of them, not even half, more than half of them are all imported into the country. We see that um, if you have a Toyota hybrid that is in here, it's definitely imported into the country. Most of our cars are going to come from around the world. Without doing much, the transition will happen. Whether we do much, whether we cross our legs, we do nothing at all. The transition is going to come to us. So the conversation is now, how do we prepare ourselves to be able to take that transition in our own conversation? Now, an average EV, that will move us into the two and three that conversation. An average EV, when we come into the country, I'm going to just talk about some of the best Chinese vehicles, like a um, an Ella good cut, average is about $36,000, even when it comes to the shores of Ghana. How many of us are going to afford that car? Or how many of us are going to transition to that? The Yulin, all the others, the all are good cuts. And again, I'm mentioning most Chinese brands because of numbers and because of prices, right? You're looking at the so the Chinese brands, what are they looking at? $8,000, $10,000. And even if you have $4,000 in China, by the time it goes to Ghana, it's about $8,000. Where does the transition come from? We are sold. So to be up on his point, when he talks about accessibility, I want you to talk about affordability. When you take an evening, so the good part, you're having a 60 kilowatt battery. Unit. But when you have a three and three wheeler, Two kilowatt battery, four kilowatt battery. So look at what in terms of battery production, where can we sustain? Where what is the lowest common fit for us in this case? Is the two and three years, and that is talking about affordability to both the rural areas and to some of the urban areas, as well as talking about the ability to produce it within our context. That is where the conversation will come to in a couple of years' time. I don't need to talk much because I can talk to you about English. I'll hand it over to, to Dr. Otto to, 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 to go with that. I don't know who you are. Well, you're the last person to see it. <laughs> Especially in Africa, which has particular interests and for two reasons. The, the first one is in terms of value. If you look at the business, and I'm saying that we do a lot of research to our researchers in African vehicles and all that. If you look at the statistics, what we have done in China, some of Africa, there is a fast transition to the end of the US in January. The four the ownership of four units and the connection to that is what we are seeing is a rise in that. So, how the realization is still being done. It's a fast transition in that we don't have, for example, we don't have. The rickshaws, the cargo rickshaws, and the passenger rickshaws, what we call the Kajia, the Kajia, just to make it as an example for you. 
It's only on the lease. Same with uh, motorcycles. So it just makes sense that our conversation will be towards the improvements to the general position of the mess. Secondly, what we see here in terms of the infrastructure requirements, it is easier to transition to PMP as faster. Um, so, for the energy, we are charging stations to set up. The employees can charge charges. There's no two charges. But very important is technological. Um, I think it will be surprising of you to know that when it comes to hybrid carbon emissions and carbon monoxide emissions, we can emit about four times those kinds of emissions compared to the state of the vehicle. The motorcycle emits more hydrocarbon and more carbon monoxide. No matter the size, why? Because the motor cycle propelled vehicles have left behind in terms of emission technology development. In four wheels, if you have less, you mostly have an abstract treatment system with catalytic converters. Users, the whole system works and the users before it comes out. The cycles don't have that sophisticated system. Um, it is not trying to catch up, but even the models don't have that entire sophisticated system. So, with four wheelers, if you have a good fuel, say you have five, you have four fuel. The emissions will be much less. That fuel is used to be a motorcycle, especially um, in the region where motorcycles are also um, very So, in terms of the transition to two and three wheels, it's very important because we stand the chance of reducing um, emissions and increasing air quality in this electric fuel. Is compared to others. Also, because the, the volume is going up, also because it requires less infrastructure uh, to transition. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, oh, sorry, I forgot I have mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thanks uh, to my panelists. Um, we've we've uh, shared some perspectives on why the transition to EVs is important. And also help us to appreciate the of the segments. As we come to you, now we're going to talk about policies and regulatory frameworks. So, Chrissy, you are from the private sector side. Um, from Doris's submission, one issue came up uh, very clearly. By the time the vehicles move from China or wherever to this place, the price is almost doubled. Um, what are some of the policy um, interventions, policy support that you expect from government? And when you're done, um, I'll pretend I don't know what's happening on the government side. Uh, Doris will tell us what is, is happening. So policies and regulatory frameworks, yes. Okay, so on the policy side, um, one of the things that supports, uh, how do you say it? Green industries will be um, tax incentives, of course. Um, so, usually you would find that in high industrialized places like. Yeah, Andy, yes. What is that? Yes. Speak out a bit. I think we can do this. Yeah, that would be. Take my other. That's the trick. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. Right, so tax incentives, one of the major things um, in uh, highly industrialized places like, say, China, etc. Um, the government encourages 
industrialization by uh, making certain um, things available to the companies. Like, for example, you get the opportunity to like have access to a vast amount of land for a very low amount but in a limited area. So what this means is that they are able to and force development in that area by relocating the uh, industry to that area. Because usually you will move to your factory, you will build your, um, how do you say, accommodation for your factory workers, and then people slowly migrate to that area because of the traffic in that area. So tax incentives. And also, um, on the government side, one of the things that really help us is um, the speed of implementation after some announcements. So, or, yeah, so sometimes we get the announcement or, or the government is planning to do X, Y, Z. However, between the time it is set to the yeah, announced to the general public and when it's actually implemented, without any, how do you say, aggressive industry, how do you say, follow up, it almost never happens sometimes. Um, so that's one of the things we're also looking for. And then also resourcing, I would say, supporting the technical institutions. Uh, Social institutions um, with the necessary implements to allow them to create industry bridges um, um, between the academia and the technical and um, the how do you say the various institutions. So one of the things usually the complaint from everybody is that when you do engineering in Ghana, um, you never get any practical experience. And one of the how do you say reasons you get from the tertiary side is that sometimes there's just not enough funding to be able to facilitate these kind of activities. The students say that there's something that will help them. The industry says there's something that will help them. So it's something that the governmental policies also can intervene into. So these main three things. Um, ideally for growing uh, industries as well, it will help. It's not like uh, nice to have, but there's some kind of um, procurement policy. So for some of the items that can be locally produced, uh, like a procurement policy to have a percentage of its produce um, procured from uh, local industry, it does two things. It allows the, the local industry to penetrate the market and have people experience the vehicle. And then it also provides a business case for the private institutions to also secure more funding from external entities. So this, right. thank right. you. So when you come to bills, um, Casey talks about tax incentives, talks about the uh, industry, academia, that, the speed of government uh, implementation of announced um, government policies. So let's, let's be from the government side that you want uh, the audience to know. I think I'm taking this seat because I'm a new ecosystem. So, classify, I will just set the record straight that I am not, so to speak, in the opening for the government. But I have been in a new like system since 2019, setting up the dielectric initiative. So, I think mostly what people see uh, that attack the praise on both sides equally. And I appreciate both sides. Um, I get the attack more than I get the, the praise. But I think that is one of the things I think we have to be able to distinguish between when we have innovators that come into the system through the government sector trying to build something. I think we should understand that it's usually a journey for them to get to that point. It's just the same as Quincy, the, uh, the young guys are doing private sector um, entrepreneurship. I'm literally doing entrepreneurship with doing the government, trying to build something that's an ecosystem. So please let's have that clear. Now, setting up a live electric machine doesn't mean that the person who sets it up their mind is for everybody. So I literally challenge a whole system to get up to do their work. The literal transfer had to get up to do policy work. The no new policy was only, it only came to be last year, November, I could. Before then, there was no policy. Getting the GRE to be your jobs adequate, but in good way to start to put data in place for EVs. Because when you do the first business for that, which I did with clearly just see, data for the country. So I understand that there are several institutions that should be able to work together to make EV transition in the country work. 
when it came to incentives, the journey was that the incentives had to be approved from the Ministry of Finance. Yes, I initiated incentives. I will the incentive policy. I drive it through. But this started in 2020. Our incentives were in 2023. So I want you to first appreciate the journey it takes for us to get that announcement. Then now I appreciate the implementation of it. The incentives we have to do is we need to tax for manufacturers of EV, if you are manufacturer of EV, you are importing the parts, you are SKB or CKD, you are getting an import you are SKB, you are selling that down, CKD completely not down parts. So based on the parts you are bringing down, you are getting moving. But that is a nice first when the institutional arrangement is made that you'd have to deal with the GRO can plan of the productivity, in this case the customs. Customs will require you as a company to register with customs, and then through the registration, you have to be registered as a manufacturer within the country, have the manufacturing license and all these processes. Because, yes, we have a system once an incentive is announced, everybody tries to you know, convert their salon business to become a manufacturer and just get a leave to bring some parts down. We are beating the system ourselves, so the system tries to be resilient. But that is the tax incentive statute government. See the announcement of the tax incentive. Yes, I've had several calls on the speed with which the incentives can be implemented. But the implementation of the incentives right now has to slowly sit with the Ministry of Finance, run through customs. The push from customs is that we also need to get the systems right to be able to take this from the pit, which I believe is good because. Some people have told me how to do this. So I think that that started in February has been crushed and is moving. When it comes to policy, yes, we need a very policy. The framework that sets transition of mobility in the right place. So the Ministry of Transport, working with all of us, we all sat on the steering committee to draft together that new policy document that we have today. The policy clearly states each institution and how you want to live it. It takes you to three phases of EV implementation. Plan. The first phase, of course, is now to 2026, and that is kind of setting the groundwork for EV. Then there are up to 2035, which is supposed to be having 45% penetration of EVs. And what we need to do to get that, the implementation of that, of course, is through the two and three markets, which is very critical for us. And if the two and three markets needs to survive, we need to be able to put the parts on our own down here in Bali. And that is where really this comes from. That is why we're able to push for that incentive to go through, because to do that, you need the people to have less cost, the less cost for you guys, not just you, rather there's Kofa, there's Max Mobility. I could keep naming them all of them in the industry or trying to assemble to this and to this to get them to be able to do the work they have to do to bring the cost down and the elements down that incentive. And this was driving to the bigger framework of 35 by 35, like I call it 35 percent by the 2035 framework. So that is a variety of framework. Now, in terms of Charging, which Doug has pointed out in terms of two and three charging in terms of battery swaps. We're saying yes, as much as averagely the electric cars we use will drive it, will charge it at home. Yes, all the time I use EVs, I charge 80% at home, true, and maybe the other 20% will be at a public charging station, maybe the one at least condition, or sometimes the one at ABC. But if you are doing this, we need to ask ourselves how then do we, we're saying that for us. To be able to push the charging framework in the country, we need to have the private sector on board. So here I've mentioned the policy framework, the working policy framework. I've mentioned the incentives, which is now going to be I'm going to just touch on the infrastructure in this case, which is the charging. It's not as we see it in so many other parts of the world. In Europe, you see the, the municipals, the governments driving the charging infrastructure across. 
the environment is going to be more different as the private sector that is actually leading this framework. So far, the documentation that we submitted to us and the people who need to move into install charging stations in Ghana shows clearly that the private sector is excited about the business opportunity of that angle. But to be able to get the private sector right into that, we need to get a standards for charging right and the regulations for charging because it's that framework that will set and uh, streamline the market for us to be able to get the private sector. So it's more like a public private partnership, but in this case, you're getting government to be able to set the groundwork in terms of the regulations and in terms of the standards and um, for charging, which we have done. We, we have finished the standards and we're working on regulations. The draft regulations are available. I'm glad we have the regulation. So we have uh, the draft regulation available. We just end up with stakeholder consultations. And it also be on the website of the Energy Commission for comments from the general public as well. I mean, the first takeover happened last Monday. The next one is happening this very Friday in Kumasi. So we, we get that it has to be. This is still the building phase. It may look like it's so far off, like it's been the past four or five years, but it's still the building phase. And this to be able to get the baseline right, to be able to get policy work in place, to be able to get standards in place, to be able to get regulations in place, and incentives authorized for the country. It's a step in the right direction, but I believe there is more that can be done. But in terms of the institutional beliefs and how they get back to you, and you said that it would have to be institution basis. I don't want to speak to the institutions, but it have to be. I've come in to try to speed up certain processes, but the more I do that, I think the more I, I set the system up for failure. I want to get the system to be one minute in without even coming into um into uh like I say, like I've done that for Rambo, I've done that for several companies, but I need mean, have to let the system work to be able to it took it a bit slow, but I mean, we have to let the system work in this case. So yes, government has put in place the incentives, the policy, the regulation, the standards, but I would agree with him that yes, the institutional um delays in the democratic way and how to get the uh, the documents up. I, I really can't speak to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. That was uh, very extensive. So we have the policy, policy in place. We are tax rates for uh, the manufacturers. But she says you have to register with the customs at the appropriate category, right? Uh, but she also mentioned something that crazy. You may be interested in taking notes that some. And uh, businesses are already enjoying the 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 business and they've told them how they did it. So we have to talk to them. Then we move on to Macedonia. Extensively, I think there are a few people that I know in Africa who go to an UVs more than you. So it's, um, how do you see the role of policy and the uh, regulation, the frameworks, and um, how does that broadly Help in accelerating the transition as we have on the on the on the banner. Why do we need this to accelerate? Thank you very much. So, um, all over the world, just to use the the countries that have done very well in this: China, Norway, and the rest. We we are doing very well because of the uh, incentives. Um, to be specific, fiscal incentives, and that has to do with money. So, if you think the money transition, um, there are, there are incentives for manufacturing vehicles. Charging stations were set up by the police, and um, a lot of the money from the uh, oil and gas was channeled to. Um, the starting incentives in Norway. Similarly, in, in China, um, a lot of the reasons we have uh, almost all movies to Africa from China is because China, China has a lot of incentives for electric vehicles, basically, through and through and all the uh, Others that the other Western nations are struggling to compete with. Even if you take the United States, um, 
incentives, incentives, charging infrastructure incentives, and uh, fleet, fleet incentives as well. So yes, um, it's very necessary to have incentives, uh, especially fiscal incentives, because the initial cost of an EV, whether it's a uh, four wheeler or two and three wheeler, it's still way really higher than uh, its compatriots in terms of the internal combustion engine uh, engines uh, for many reasons because uh, they've not reached the volume for profitability yet as in internal combustion engine vehicles. So there, there needs to be an acceleration. Um, for us to start off so that we, are, we don't fall behind. I mean, um, Africa fell behind in terms of the internal commercial engine vehicle uh, manufacturing, we fell behind completely. Um, as you always were saying, more than 90% of all the vehicles we have here, about 95, uh, despite the assembly plans we have still come in a, a imported. So to get ahead of this new technology, it's important we have these vehicles here in quantities so that we can also figure out how to maintain them and how to manufacture them and how to recycle uh, them as well. So we need an acceleration um, so that we can get ahead of uh, Africa, the rest of Africa, um, in terms of this policy is very important. Fortunately, apart from the fiscal incentives, I think Ghana is one of the best in Africa when it comes to policies, uh, especially policies that are more uh, fiscal, yeah, one of the best, because we have an EV policy, uh, which most of Af even um, South Africa doesn't have an EV policy as we speak now. Um, we have a uh, uh, investment plan, we have investment framework, we have standards, electric vehicle charging standards, we have the electric vehicle standards itself, we have an electronic waste uh, act, I think the act 917 from the EPA, which governs how these items should be recycled. We have all the documentation. Um, the only one we are, we are not doing very well in is the, is the fiscal incentives. And we hope this time the EU policy state that we are in the differential phase and that from 27 we expect a uh, massive fiscal incentives. Uh, that's what I've said. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the, I'm glad you referred to the Garden Electric EV baseline uh, study reports because that, that report was published just about two years ago. And uh, one of the action points that was um, stated in that was to provide framework and regulation for, for charging infrastructure, etc. So it's very exciting to note that. Um, uh, we don't think yes, so much is happening within the, uh, within the system. So please, uh, for those of you who have questions from my panelists, I'll be coming to you shortly. But um, let, me, let me come to, uh, to Godwin. Godwin, um, when I was preparing to model this, I did a little search and I realized last year you published a paper your three colleagues uh, from Rwanda and South Africa. It's titled Visibility of Electric Between Two and Three Years in Africa. It's the issue of lack of quality standards. Lack of quality standards as a challenge. To of, uh, of, of the companies. Um, and let's say a bit about that. Um, how does uh, the absence of this in the cell as an obstruction to the market space? Thank you very much. So, actually, in terms of the standards implementation, um, there's a huge gap in the it is 
it's important to state that the, the standards govern what we call immigration. Immigration. When if you are born a number of new vehicles into the country, may have a certain number. Um, if it gets to that number, then you need to subject the vehicles to immigration with the Ghana Standards Authority. And then the Ghana Standards Authority will have to check whether these are uh, coming in, the vehicles coming in meet these specific standards. And unfortunately for Ghana, most of our cars don't come in through those means. Our vehicles mostly come in as used vehicles. So even though there's been some standard to try to reduce that it's not been implemented, it means inequality comes in as it is. So moving on study, study um South Africa um with electric vehicle startups they try to examine their vehicles to see if they meet the advertised standards. Uh, one aspect for example is the range. A very important aspect of an electric vehicle is how far it can go before it will need to be charged. It's very important for consumers to know that. So we tried to check if they meet the advertised standards by the companies. They did not. By a wide margin, they did not. Secondly, they get the center we call deterioration when it comes to electric vehicles. In other words, if you get a vehicle the first time, the vehicle may take you 300 kilometers before you need to charge again. Okay, let me use a um, physical object. So, like, if you are going from here to, say, see, maybe it before you need to charge. It has to remove that way or about that way for at least eight years. It has to remain that way, but that way at least within eight years. But if you leave that eight years, you get to leave that way stop, and that's it. That's a big deterioration. And um, you get to somewhere soon and then to charge again. We agree that's a big deterioration. So we find out that we do. Uh, we actually two and three dollars, and the four um, electric dollars, four dollars are coming into Africa. Most customers are not happy with the rate of deterioration of the, the range. And for an electric two and three dollars, the, the life cycle for a battery, uh, maybe four years, three, four years, but we realize that for some of them, Within one year, you have to replace the battery. And for an electric vehicle, the challenge with that is that the battery, the cost of the battery is more than half the cost of the entire car. That is to give you an idea of the challenge with this. And so we realize that standards need to be implemented to be able to get the right. Uh, standard of vehicles coming into Africa, not just that we want to see an electric vehicle, so it's being brought in, but um, we must not reduce the confidence. Already, there are a lot of myths around electric vehicles, so if we have products like that coming in, it's um, people lose confidence um, in that. And the challenge with batteries, too, is that we don't make batteries. And imagine you have to replace your battery, you have to import the battery and you have to pay tax on the battery. And so, um, we, that, that is our conclusion that the standards need to be implemented. And uh, also, the some of the startups, a lot of the things are a bit um, the specification, are engineering specifications. And some of the implications of the specifications too have to be brought forward to the EV startups to know 
um, what kind of vehicles uh, they should bring in. I hope. Yes, 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 you have. I see that Brent wants to uh, tell you, please, 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 please. Yes, I think the first uh, please, 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 I'll come to you on how these um, regulations and standards help your business. So what, um, uh, how do I say it, um, you know, what hurdles do they present? You know, we can look at it from both sides. Can be a facilitator of your business. It could also be a header. So I'll, I'll invite you for a comment on that. Okay, so I, I, I thought I wanted to add to that because I think the conversation here is what happens in Europe or what happens out there as cars are manufactured within there. The reverse we see here when it comes to our continent. And I think very recently when we published their report, it's shown that in on the whole continent, over 50% of our cars are imported, which means over 50%, up to 60% of our EVs are going to be imported. I mean, if you do that analogy, it's, it just sits right. So then the conversation now becomes how we're going to do our standards to the extent that we are able to regulate the kind of used EVs that come into the country. As Bob was mentioning this right, we were saying an average EV probably will have a battery life of about 10 years to 50 years, depending on the kind of EV. So let's even start as well as 80 years to about 15 in terms of that range. If you have that EV and you've used it for five years, then you have to ship it down to Ghana. Assuming you have three years left on the evening, but five years on that battery, where are you going to get out of the battery? This is where the battery is going to be done to out here on this continent. So the, the conversation now goes to re standardizing it. So one of the standards conversations which we are we, we started, of course, there have been about 50 standards adopted so far. I think more than that, even for EVs itself, really. But that is going to help in the homologation in terms of the new vehicles that you are going to send in the country. But Beyond that is the transition of the used EV. So the transition of the used EV is trying to put a number on the battery life. So it's trying to say that if the battery life is below 80% or 70%, you can't bring it into the country, which is fair enough because if you're bringing a battery that the value of the battery that may give you 30 or 30% 30 of battery life, how many years are you going to have to dispose of it here? Already, you can't even how you cycle a lot of the batteries, let batteries, let alone the batteries of this range of this side. So I thought I'd have to mention that clearly, that and it's not a conversation that just happened, um, not just done, but it's something that the African Union is taking up and trying to get that um, from the map and the most recent meeting that was held at the to be able to bring that context so that we have uh, standardization for the next years. When you go to Europe, the current conversation is that the batteries that are going to come down are going to have what we call battery passports, right? Now, battery passport is trying to tell you when you are getting the EVs from Europe, the battery, you know, the battery, you know all the components of that battery from there, and the battery can be traced as the battery moves along. So when a car is coming from, let's say, Copenhagen, and the car finally finds the way to South Africa. We know the journey of that battery and where that battery is getting to be disposed of. It could be beneficial in terms of when it comes to the environmental impact of the battery and the end of life of that battery. But this also becomes a conversation in the, the geographic and political conversations around trying to use battery to choose mainly because you know the companies of the battery can come back to you in a very beneficial way because the very just end when the battery is done, say you have second life user, you can have third life user, the battery depends on how you push that conversation. So that is really something that is being worked on. It's not that it's not the mission at all. It's just the standardizations are coming for that and that will be able to help us to address the second um, life use of the batteries, but also for the most EVs that are going to come into the country. Yeah, so I'll address the um, earlier comment about the the standards and how they affect the uh, the products that we put out. The thing about standards is that it depends the quality generally of the product. 
The reason why I usually European cars are expensive is because there's a lot of European regulation around vehicle production. Um, it is more of a balancing act in our markets because we are an emerging economy. So we have to every times balance the performance with the affordability because unfortunately, about a certain price point, you pay for profit. You have to pay for performance. So you mentioned something about uh, the vehicles not, um, is not lasting the um, specified uh, time. That's just down to cost. So if you pay more, you get better sales uh, as a consequence. But unfortunately, you can also increase the price to a certain amount because then you price out a large amount, large part of the market. So this is where some of the other ways of um, other ways to mitigate the price barrier can come in. So things around incentives. So when you when you get like some kind of incentive, like uh, maybe no tax or you pay maybe up to 80% of the vehicle because the government will subsidize some part of the purchase. So these kind of things is where we encourage people to have EVs and also have good quality EVs. Because uh, we just really want to encourage uh, the transition to EV only to dump the not so good EVs like a month or two later. So that's where the policy instruments kind of help us um, also in a sense, not in the but we need a life of it, of course, because um, because we are an emerging economy, I get that things with our economy are also emerging. Like, for example, green quality is something which we are always improving. And unfortunately, developing for um, uh, and hard services increases the performance requirements of the vehicle um, in terms of like the components and also things like the battery. Um, it's around like uh, purchasing power because the road is not good. I have to make the vehicle better, but if I make the vehicle too good, you can't afford it. So it's a, um, these are requirements that we constantly juggle. Uh, our vehicle, what we have inside is a representation of what we have, and uh, we have been able to achieve so far. And in terms of localization, it's one of the things that we're also looking to do in terms of like making a lot of the past local so that we don't suffer from. Certain things that are out of our control, or certain things that certain things that are now being um, that are now going. So, yeah, for the policy side, that's what's really will harm or be good for us. Like, not nothing. Right, fantastic. So, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a very it's balancing act that um, countries and um, jurisdictions have to um, uh, have to uh, embark on. So at this point, I'll, I'll come to you. Uh, I saw a lot of people taking notes. So it's time now for us to take your questions. But I've been pointed that we don't have much time. I think we are here. Uh, just about how many? Five? Yeah. So we shall try and make it brief. There's a hand up. Okay, before I go there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, this question is for Darius. Um, that is right. Yeah, good. You were talking about encouraging private sector investment in building infrastructure, charging infrastructure. I don't know if you've put that into the costs that would emerge as a result of private sector investment in that sector and not to encourage public financing of charging infrastructure, which will definitely reduce costs as opposed to private sector investment. And um, he talked about not creating a situation where you overprice the commodity that would remove certain people or society from accessing it. Because if the cost is high, then it's going to be difficult for people to be able to use either the EVs, whether they are two, two wheelers or three wheelers or even the, the, the four wheelers. Okay, so anyone else? Yeah, so, uh, my, my name is Mubarak, and uh, my question goes to those. You know, because, um, I've heard from industry players that there is a policy to move taxes on the importation of EVs. Two wheels and three wheels are exempted. I've heard people, I don't want mention names, are exempted. Just um, a short while ago, the CEO of um, Yahoo didn't mention that she pays about $1,000 of taxes on a bike. 
is the issue that the government still hasn't taken off with giving these incentives and that um, this happens in the process of um, being certified or if, if you like, um, I'm accepted to benefit from these incentives. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nathaniel. Uh, my first question is um, listening to the panelists. Um, I'm very happy that we are providing various standardization within the AV framework. Uh, my first question is what's the policy plan on advocacy in order to educate uh, people, educate people, and within their families on the types of charging systems that we have with EVs? And even the modes of charging so that we go that okay, I can use this one for house with socket charging, or I can use the fast charger in my home. Also, my other question is regards to the cycling. Um, is, should we use way to do a skill map or to think of having bigger industries before we start recycling? Can we start small recycling companies? The country, so that if we have these batteries who are going out of the lifespan, we can have these small recycling factories to even add on to IMB within the framework. And then the last one is I'm a part of various modifications that people are doing to add less power to uh, EV cars. And it is a policy on EV modifications. Thank you. Thank you, I'm William. So, Chrissy mentioned earlier on about policies not being implemented when we are moved. So, with the tax exemptions and other stuff, I was in, I joined a con conference held in Kenya where they were talking about how they were to implement their tax and other policies made in the country. So, they basically said they had formed an EV association where EV companies came together to push those taxes, uh, to push those policies. We noticed that policies are since there's no one pushing those policies, nobody pays attention to them, it becomes ghost. And also with the recycling, we don't really create and depend on the listeners to start something, but we really follow. I think it's it's high time we start in our own spirits, like you mentioned, let's give. Research grants to people to find find ways of recycling these machines because it's become a problem for us to handle. And also with the standards that uh, you made mention of, you realize certainly most of these vehicles built outside, they build it to fit, fit that environment. They don't, they don't, they're not building to fit the African environment. So if people are importing these vehicles, they should consider the environment you are in and you assembling and building this bikes, you, you should look at the African environment and bring down my um, manufacture very good that suits our environment to promote good quality. There's a lady at the back, her hand is going to have for you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So in all of the conversations I've been listening to concerning the EVs, I haven't heard of the downside or the disadvantages of the batteries and how these um, batteries can be stored or, and also um, in terms of the disadvantages of the effects on us, how prepared are we as a continent, Africa, to just look at the other side and say, this is another research, because now the conversation is about R&D and the, the, the relation to the transition. But again, we need to sit and start having separate conversations of our safety. Thank you. Uh, until we have pressed for time. So let's see how we can compress it. Uh, maybe a very quick snappy responses. Maximum, we said 30, 30 seconds, but maximum one minute. <laughs> so I can answer the last lady's question. The good thing about us doing this at this time now is that we've learned from some of the mistakes in the um, 
it's not a very easy company so I'll start writing down and have some kind of second life. I can speak to our company. So that we are we have a long term life um long term plan for the batteries. So after the time this as a progression energy storage source, uh the batteries are then going to be flipped to the use as a second energy storage source for having your laptops and other touchable devices before moving towards the stage where they are recycled to their elemental um, components. The elemental components, which is like the third to last stage, is that we are going to be searching on first life and second life is something that we have in the works to do. So that's on that side in terms of the batteries. Um, in terms of uh, um, application of the, uh, the vehicles, Vehicle uh, is um, something that is a bit more, uh, how do you say, tricky to enforce. Because um, unlike um, the ICE vehicles where you can tell that the car has been modified, um, if you can be uh, or detained by two um, pushing the button, so it will be very difficult to police not on helping people in the um, and so I will go straight to two and three things. Um, exceptions of a point of advice your first questions. One is the questions on two and three things. Exemptions, if you go to the budget statement, you can read this clearly for yourself, just so it doesn't look like I'm quoting something. We on the tax relief, I think it's on page 17 and 18. Again. And the tax relief, you can read the exemptions in the budget statement yourself. So what is being covered is public transportation of EVs and the buses, the public transportation. What the they need to stick to to clarify is for the buses, is covering buses in buses. Now the parts is what is covered under the exemption, not a full two and three wheeler. So there are two things here. You bring two and three wheeler, a full two and three wheeler to the port is not covered. Again, the conversation is towards manufacturing and encouraging a sector that is going to manufacture and assemble the drain. So to do that, it is the parts. That's why I said the SKD or CKD. So either a semi knockdown part or completely knockdown part is what that is capturing, not the full um, um, two and three. I hope that is clear on that. On the travel infrastructure, I think you mentioned something about why government doesn't invest in that, uh, invest in that rather than private sector. Going. I mean, I started trying to push government to give investment in that. But when you see funding, see the direction of funds, it means that it took a while for government to go into that sector. You ask yourself, who are the other players in the sector? Now, even if the government started taking a part in this sector, the private sector had already jumped ahead of us. They were rather starting to, the very first ones that were installed, uh, the one at AAC main, but of course, that is a level two charger, but those were the ones that had been installed. And then we went into most of them being level two chargers, I mean, level two clear most of them to be two clear out. But then over time, you see another coming, the next condition is the 60 kilowatt battery. As I speak to you, another is coming up, that is 160 kilowatt charging capacity. You know, you, you can tell that the private sector sees the business angle of it, right? But we have asked ourselves, then how do we make it more, because you know how policy and regulations drive investments in its own way. It's an incentive for investment. So if you have clearly written on how the regulations are going to be, how standards are going to be, yes, it can actually encourage private sector to participate even more, and that is what we're seeing happening right now. The, the Potential of actually having a different tariff for the public charging systems is high because when we have a different tariff for me, that you can have to we have even you are um, classified as bird purchase is not, and this isn't an example as we are classified that limited electricity tariff is going to be a lot of money. So then you can be able to slap and make live taxes and stuff to be able to accommodate you. But at the moment, it's not yet been um, regulated in terms of tariffing, the economic cost of it hasn't yet been regulated. But that's why government tried to do this. In some jurisdictions, you know, government put money, but in our jurisdiction, I try to encourage a public private partnership 
issue because private sector is eager to jump on board even without government. And this is the way to go. Have a minute. We've got a transition. We have it all together that we're transitioning. And I think it's on EV charging. Um, this is a conversation that is really after the revolution. So as we are doing the stakeholder consultations, is one of the conversations that we are pushing out in terms of the different levels of charging and what it can the impact. Of course, having an EV and charging at um, um, level three charger all the time also has impact on your battery. There's so many other things. It's, it's sort of a balancing act. So it's all that conversation to come in. But the regulations is clearly directory safety, which has been our concern. That is why this is being regulated. Because you're not just going to have you bring, buy a car and install a charger at home and start charging. And when your house burns down, it's a bad the, the, the conversation becomes that how do you regulate it? And you need to control what you do to. So one of these regulations as we go through is very complex. That means that we can get to be engaging the public to be able to see the, the potential of the different levels of charging for the buildings. Now the downstream of it, I'll tackle the downstream the recycling the downstream and let's look at the batteries. The regulation is trying to now find a way to get that when you want to install a battery swap, right? You have a battery swap, you just have a battery swap system. You should be able to at least have a plan of action on the batteries. And when you have a battery uh, cell problem, you have to use the battery on that hole. So it's supposed to tackle the downstream angle on that. I would have to categorically state that go to um, the more developed African places like in East Africa where you have a narrative for reason. Let me use them as an example. We have sat with any of them from Basile to Oregon. They don't have their uh, recycling down right. They, they, they don't even have anything in stored yet, right? I ask the question, do you need to invest on the recycling when you start the business or how do you do it? So then you go start first and then after a while you invest into that. Right? So it's a conversation that probably we're getting into, but I don't see us moving so fast to go the recycling without really getting the batteries in place and the, the emissions will sort of go through that. But how you have the EPA regulations for industrial emission, right? So you go to industrial emission, when you are emitting above level, you need to come with a plan of action and how you before your license is renewed. So these are all the means that we're going to use to be to reduce the downstream part of it. I would leave Mr. Uh, Sam for me to, to speak to the director. The director, that's the thing. So that must be for 30 seconds. Yes. Um, so on that case, whether we are prepared, no, it's not prepared. It's not going to be done now. No, it's not prepared. Because these are getting to their end of life. They became prepared in 2013, 2014, 2015. They last for about 10 years. I mean, the batteries. So we are there now. So if we are now making arrangements for recycling, so the world is not um, in terms of just one more, in terms of modification, um, little little modification. Okay, so picture of vehicles in general, term modification of vehicles in general is rather is illegal. Um, because it affects the the power requirement of the car, it affects the length of the car and ultimately affects making efficiency, making distance, which affects safety. So it's in the safety act. The lecture for repairs and it's going to go for the money of the you have to go for before license plates and um, for that vehicle. That's how much we don't have a little modification. And it is a very really right thing because it affects the engine of the car and makes the car uh, the car becomes uh, it's no longer roadworthy. So that kind of thing should be discouraged, especially for electric vehicles. We should not do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, my distinguished panelists. So um, I am moving straight to wrap up. Um, we are doing the subject of looking at P3S uh, as part of the sustainable mobility uh, transition. Um, our panel has helped us to appreciate why this um, the transition is important. The 
uh, specific benefits that come uh, with um, focusing on the two three uh, wheeler section. Um, the benefits that come with this, um, the need to meet government targets, the NDCs, and the fact that it's, um, it's an easier entry point compared with the other segments. We went going to look at some of the policies and the regulatory issues. We went much, much deeper. And then we concluded on a very um, interesting note. And I took note that uh, we answer all the questions and we admit that we have taken the initial uh, first steps. It's not going to be, I mean, it's going to be iterative. We will get it right um, in one flight. So, um, but that means we've taken the, the initial steps. So, on this note, let me thank uh, Quincy. Uh, you are from Wahoo. Yes, you are one of the, the main entrepreneurs who have uh, uh, taken the risk as a first, first movers. I believe a lot is going to be learned from your experiences uh, to guide the way forward. Those using the Drive Electric Initiative at the Energy Commission, we worked very hard with your colleagues to create a framework, a legal regulatory incentive framework for the, um, for the sector. And this is like your, your progress, um, was to Banka and Co. who drove the government. Your efforts will definitely be uh, in the years to come. Thank you very much from PMUS. I'm aware that we a lot, not just for Ghana, uh, but also for Africa. We uh, recently included uh, an assignment for the government of Sakuni and Pacific, so that's across, across Africa, uh, helping to shape the future of the transport sector. Next, I come to you. Uh, your participation has been very active. I'm sure it's been good at the whole day in the state of Maine. So I come to you uh, for your very stimulating questions. Please, let's put our hands together for our parents and for ourselves. Yes, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists and uh, thank you to everyone of you for taking our time to attend uh, this site event. Um, Dr. Kwanza, I want to say a big thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kwanza is the director of the Brehaban Energy Center. Um, thank you for taking our time to moderate this session. Please, um, before we go, just a few announcements. We need arrangement for refreshments, but due to some policies within the hotel, they say we can't bring them in. So we have the vendor who is there that has packaged it for us. Um, she's outside, she's on yellow t-shirt. She's willing to move us to where we will be able to get these packages. And uh, also, the main event still continues. So they said we are needed back at the hall. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your coming, we appreciate your time. And this is a continuous conversation, like we said. We will reach out to you via your emails and the contact addresses that you have dropped for us. Once again, we wish you a safe trip back to your various destinations. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.